their gallantry, he would have proved the victor in this race, had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman, while this clumsy lover was striving to free his white ash, and while, in consequence, Derek's boat was nigh to capsizing, and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage. That was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With the shout, they took a mortal start forwards, and slantingly ranged upon the Germans' quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonically in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them, on both sides, was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke, he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast dumb brute of the sea, was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable. While still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw, and omnipotent tail, there was enough to apple the stoutest man who so pitied. Seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the Pequod's boats the advantage, and rather than be thus foiled of his game, Derek chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did his harpo understand up for the stroke, than all three tigers, Kweekug, Tashko, Daggu, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpo -wunner. their three Nantucket irons entered the whale blinding vapor of foam and white fire. The three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force, that both Derek and his baffled harpal oneer were spilled out, and sailed over by the three flying keels. Don't be afraid, my butter boxes, cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by. Yell will be picked up presently. All right. I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know, relieve distressed travelers. Hurrah! This is the way to sail now. Every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah! Here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plane, makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way, and there's danger of being pitched out too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones, all rush down an endless inclined plane. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With the grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such a force as to gouge deep grooves in them, while so fearful were the harpal oneers that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines, that using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last, Owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead line shocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunnels of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns tilted high in the air, and the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish. But though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called.
this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the Leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted. Because, owing to the enormous surface of him, in a full-grown sperm whale something less than 2,000 square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, even here, above ground, in the air. How vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of 200 fathoms of ocean. It must at least equal the weight of 50 atmospheres. One whale man has estimated it at the weight of 20 line of battleships, with all their guns, and stores, and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble came up from its depths, what landsmen would have thought, that beneath all that silence and placidity, the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony. Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock. Suspended? And to what? To three bits of board. Is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said, Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? or his head with fish spears, the sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon, he esteemeth iron as straw, the arrow cannot make him flee, darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. This the creature? This he? Oh, that unfulfillments should follow the prophets! For with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail, Leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea, to hide him from the Pekiot's fish spears. In that sloping afternoon sunlight, the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface, must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half Xerxes' army. Who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? Stand by, men! He stirs, cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upwards, as a small ice field will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. Haul in! Haul in! cried Starbuck again. He's rising. The lines, of which, hardly an instant before, not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long quick coils flung back all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ship's lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby when wounded, the blood is in some degree at least instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels, so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the wellsprings of far-off and undiscernible hills. Even now, when the boats pulled upon this whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout hole in his head was only at intervals, 
however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck. His life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange misgrown masses gather in the knot holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied, now protruded blind bulbs, hardly pitiable to see. But pity there was none, for all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered, in order to light the gay bridles and other merry-makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all.